and the history of the pink um, as Ernestine's juke joint um, and learning more about Clifford's mother, Beulah, and the way that Clifford literally grew up in Ernestine's and how she lost her mother to HIV at a very young age and just the significance of the space. Like, you know how they say that like in Sex in the City, the city of New York, like New York City is the fifth character. Like you have the four main girls and then you have like the city. That's kind of how I feel about the pink. Like we have our main characters, but the pink itself is almost like its own character. It's its 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 own world. And really seeing the significance of the space as a legacy that has been passed down through generations of Uncle Clifford's family and as some place that Uncle Clifford grew up in as a place that is home um, for her. And even seeing like later on in the season, when Keyshawn comes back and when Mercedes comes back and them having their conversation about like, you know, this place has felt more like a home. Keyshawn says this place has felt more like a home to me than my home because we all know what's going on in her home, right? Like this is a home for these people, which is what they keep trying to tell Autumn. Like this is not just a fucking building, okay? Like not only is the pink a cornerstone of the community and support and Chuck Elisa as a whole, which I talked about in my previous review, the, the services and the infrastructure that the pink provides, you know, jobs and putting bitches through college and shit like that. But of Cliff's family specifically, they really showed the importance of this space. I loved the flashback scene with Loretta Devine singing Aretha Franklin. That's my favorite Aretha song. Till you come back to me. That's what I'm going to do. I was like, oh, and I love Loretta Devine. And I love hearing her sing. One of the original dream girls. If you don't know, now you know. Like, she she did it. I love her as Ernestine. I'm really glad that they didn't kill her off. Because um, a lot of people fucking died this season. Yeah, I was I was not sure. Um, but I'm glad that, you know, hopefully she'll be back in season three. Uh, the costuming and the set design also remains fantastic across the board this season we had some really big pieces in season three uh we had Ernestine's throughout the decades which had to do you know they had to do uh convey there was no dialogue so they had to convey what what era it's supposed to be via clothes and hair and the styling um which they did really well we had the dirty dozen tour which there was a lot of costumes and hair and uh, makeup and set pieces for that. We had Pussyland, which was amazing opening set piece. We had the pink re 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 opening. Uh, Mercedes beautiful condo in Memphis. I also really liked Mercedes costumes uh, and wardrobe this season. So not that it's a problem, but like last season, I felt like Mercedes was pretty much exclusively in like athleisure wear. Like she basically always had on athleisure, like leggings and like sports bra, crop top, like zip up jackets and stuff like and sneakers and stuff like that. And this season we got to see a little bit more because of her relationship with coach and Farah, a little bit more um variation in her wardrobe and her hair and her makeup which I also really liked like when she first goes to Memphis to sign the papers I was just like gosh she looks beautiful her makeup is beautiful um and her hair I mentioned in my last review that I really love Mercedes natural hair and that they show her hair under her wigs um and like her afro that she had when they were having the auditions uh for the new girls I loved it I just thought they did a really 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 good job with with everyone but especially with Mercedes this season Big Teak's funeral was incredible the mayor's funeral with the lime green outfits which reminded me of a second line in New Orleans um Everybody having these like coordinating masks, these like bedazzled masks, COVID couture, you know, just really brilliant costuming hair and set design. I, I definitely think it was even better than last season. Um, and I also felt like there was more um, thematic, thematic dressing, like Autumn was consistently dressed in red because she's a fucking devil like she's a damn devil this season so we consistently see her in a red she has a red dress she has a red wig she has a red suit on the last episode of season one I think when she bought the pink at the auction she had on like a white suit with like a red bra like 
clearly to signify that like we think she's a savior in this white but like really she has ulterior motives underneath with this like red bra underneath uh Keyshawn is consistently dressed in blue representing you know a lost cinderella a fallen princess you know someone that's innocent but like losing their innocence like the scene where she first performs uh for mercedes in season one <clears throat> where she first performs the Lil Murda song she has like blue on and she's performing in this like blue light and when she's at like the legends the legends ball um I think that's what it was called like for the strippers and she has like her own like Miss Mississippi night she has this like blue sparkly suit on and this like blue floss like this blue performance outfit she wears like a lot of blue and in her last episode where she finally goes ham on motherfucking Derek when she's trying to escape she has like a red velour like short short set like tracksuit on so like very intentional color schemes and color choices um Lil Murda's hair constantly changes it's blue then it's black then it's platinum blonde then it's blonde and black then it's black with green and red streaks the Hurt Village Hustler colors and then it's all black with Murda cut in the back and I thought that was even like more significant because like we see other men that are looking like COVID scruffy like Derek got like a grown out beard and like grown out hair Andre got like the grown out afro and like the scruffy beard like everybody's looking scruffy we never see Lil Murda looking scruffy he's always clean shaven and he always has a cut and his hair is constantly changing he also constantly he got his mouthpiece in and he takes it out and he puts it in and it's, and it's back out just I felt like they were really visually representing how Lamarcus is struggling with his identity and the question of who is he going to be is he going to be Lil Murda or is he going to be Lamarcus is he going to be in the closet is he going to be himself freely and I feel like the fact that like damn near every episode that we see this nigga he got different hair is again a visual representation you know a part of the hair design the costuming the styling as this internal um dialogue that he's struggling with really really great visual narrative storytelling um I also really love the storyline of Keyshawn and Lil Murda blowing up and going on tour. The Dirty Dozen tour, the champagne, campaign, champagne, campaign. Like that storyline was the perfect mix of levity and seriousness, in my opinion. We see the fun of them going on tour. They're doing shows. They're premiering new songs and routines. They're dressed up. They're having fun. Like Keyshawn is finally out from under fucking Derek. Finally able to have some fun. They playing a little killer killer game which was definitely foreshadowing of the deaths of both Rome and Big Teak but at the same time there's this undercurrent of darkness even within their little killer game COVID is still ongoing tour dates are being dropped because of the racial unrest a curfew gets put in effect Rome is a piece of shit so there's tension Gidget white ass shows up in the middle of a racial reckoning so there's tension you know Lil Murder and Big Teak basically they get back together so there's ten romantically so there's tension and there's also the tension of just being on a tour grinding i felt like the dark side i'm gonna get a little bit more into the major themes a little bit later but i do want to say at this moment that i feel like the dark side of um influencing being an influencer and also trying to just like break in the industry be it the influencing industry be it you know rap in the music industry I felt like the dark side of being on a come up was also a theme um because you know we see Keyshawn who you know Keyshawn's like no I'm not a stripper anymore I'm an influencer slash pole entertainer now I got my own lash line I got my own makeup line I'm trying to get this wig line you know like she's trying to she's also trying to come up and yet she's constantly having to deal with Rome bitch ass but also having to deal with people that you know ultimately don't take her seriously and I feel like it's the same thing in a way for Lil Murda who also has this big secret of his sexuality that get, keeps continuously being brought up like I kind of feel like it's almost like an open secret like this nigga knows and that nigga knows and this person over here knows and that person over there knows and it's just the right 
just the right person needs to find out and it all all this goes away so there's the pressure of trying to maintain this image Keyshawn is basically bearding for him but there's a fine line that they're walking because they know Derek is a motherfucking psycho so like they can't go like too fucking far with this image that they're portraying and again like Keyshawn is getting her ass beat at home she's getting her ass beat at home her white nigga is unemployed they're broke they're struggling she's doing all this because she had like she literally has to do this to provide for her family and she's also getting her ass beat she's constantly having to buy makeup to cover up these bruises and marks on her face and then she also has Rome that's like constantly fucking disrespecting her and that does eventually attempt to fucking rape her and shit like that happens all the time in the influencer world people getting preyed on especially young women getting preyed on by predatory uh fake ass managers and you know labels and people that's acting like they're trying to help you but really they're trying to take advantage of you and also people that are trying to blow your whole spot up if you make one wrong move that's very real and i appreciate it that they showed that that it's not just like woo, we on tour and it's so fun and it's so cool and everybody want to be us there's tension there's tension there's tension there um and i love that they showed that and i just i but on a lighter note, like I said, it was a good mix of levity and seriousness. Because on a lighter note, I also just love the tour crew of Keyshawn, LaMarcus, Wody, and Big T. Of course, Rome was there. Fuck you, Rome. And then at a certain point, Gidget showed up also. But like this this like four core friend group, I felt like they had really great chemistry as a group. These seem like people that really like each other in real life and gel and are having a good time. Speaking of Big T, I loved his character. 